webinar. It's uh, talking. Uh, today's webinar is about hospitality. How? What is the imp the importance of uh, hospitality in the tourism industry? So we have uh, quite a good lineup for today of uh, good, very good, and uh, well-known speakers. We do have uh, the chairman of the African Tourism Board with us. Uh, we do have uh, Amaka, who is, uh, she's also one of the really known uh, diasporan who is uh, very much and keen and involved in the tourism industry. And then we have Mrs. Uh, Gita Pizzo, who is a Han representative. Uh, she's the CEO of Han, uh, which is Hospitality Association of Namibia. Uh, one of the key and strong sectors that has been uh, holding Namibia uh, for the past 30 years. And we do have um, Mozambique who will be able to join us to tell us about the importance of the tourism. How can the government through the uh, tourism and improve the way of uh, people's life? Without due delay, we'll have also um, the ITF representative who will be able to join us today to speak to us about uh, ITF. What is it ITF in general? ITF for those who have been uh, together on this journey with us, you have to know that we are speaking about tourism readiness. How can we be ready after the COVID-19? How can we be able to plan about our tourism or the future of the industry? Uh, beyond the COVID-19. Before we start these sessions, let me welcome the chairperson of uh, uh, ATB or African Tourism Board, Mr. Kube, to welcome everybody who has made time today in order to attend this uh, hospitality webinar. Mr. Kube, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator and uh, to the executive uh, of uh, this progressive team uh, and to our colleagues uh, across uh, the globe who have actually joined us together as we deliberate on this very critical and very relevant um, initiative. Dear colleagues, uh, we have noted with great concern, especially the events that have been unfolding uh, in our region for the past few days uh, that have resulted on uh, key infrastructure I mean, being uh, destroyed, coupled with the loss of life at a time when we are fighting the scourge of, uh, of this pandemic. We, 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 we appeal, we have appealed for calm and, and, and restraint, especially from all our our citizens and all our leaders uh, to at least have a dialogue and address the concerns as, as, as uh, we need to create a conducive uh, investment environment in Africa. We are very glad with the developments, especially on the ground, mm -hmm. where all parties, I mean, have joined hands together with our law enforcement mm -hmm. agencies to try to salvage mm -hmm. and save the situation and the reputation uh, of this connection hub of Africa. We all know that uh, South Africa, it's one of our strategic mm -hmm. connections have uh, to, 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 to the continent. And uh, as definitely the effects uh, of not addressing uh, could impact tourism sector adversely, let me assure you the situation is calmer day by day. Dear colleagues, tourism, um, just, right, just one second for me. Right. Dear colleagues, the, 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 the tourism has actually the potential to be an engine of economic recovery, provided we work collectively to adopt a common process and in conversation on this should be appreciated and should be adopted. 
Consequently, the path to recovery will surely be slow and gradually the resurgence of cases following another variant that has reached some pockets of Africa has delivered yet another blow to the travel sector. Positive pickups over the past mm -hmm. few months was squashed following a third wave of lockdowns. And to some other member states, we have noted lockdowns and border closures coupled with mixed progress in the rollout of the vaccination program, which by the way has exposed our disconnect as a continent and as Africans. I foresee a situation where we will not see a significant rebound in international travel until 75% of our population have been vaccinated. What do we do now? That's a million dollar question. Africa is left to fend for herself as there was no collaboration. Collaboration will at the international level, which was and is very critical in terms of uh, aligning processes and protocols globally in support of countries with no or limited access to the vaccine. It is only when investors, it is only when travelers, when businesses have confidence in the systems that the recovery sector will start to flourish again. What then for Africa? It is us this afternoon to establish consensus and build a collaborative relationship continentally, regionally, nationally, and between public and our private sectors. This should serve as a model to be replicated in order to maximize the tourism sector contributions to the continental economic recovery while ensuring that it becomes a driver of prosperity and also of our social uh, progress. Colleagues, we are beyond excited to announce the intra Africa trade 2022, 2021, which was supposed to be hosted in Kigali. Uh, and it has been shifted to, to Deben Convention Center in the Republic of South Africa. I think it is by, uh, by, by God's grace that when you look at connectivity, South Africa actually stands as a conveniency to the whole of our region. Tourism in West Africa has secured limited exhibition spaces. We are inviting you to register and showcase your destination opportunities, both as an entity or country organization. Just a few months will immense you, we will immense you in the essence of the KwaZulu-Natal with business to business matchmaking. If there was a time, colleagues, you will all concur with me. If there was a time to connect investor-ready travel, tourism and business with investor, with your private equity, your partners, and a broad range of business partnerships, it is now. Let us come together. Let's be part of this proudly intra-Africa trade fair 2021, which is around the corner. Africa, it's high time for us to stand as a block. It is high time to stand together and start looking within the continent, supporting one another, synergizing our efforts within the tourism space and also within the economic space. Thank you so much to the organizers and the process really immense our synergies together. Let us, let us rebuild, let us reshape, 
Let us reshape our destinations. Thank you so much. I welcome you all. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, from wherever you find out. You just heard the lovely words from our chairperson, uh, Chairman Mr. Kube from the African uh, Tourism Board. We have all to understand that it, this initiative is supported profoundly by the, the African Tourism Board. And Mr. Kube has been the driving force behind TIA. TIA stands for Tourism Invest Af Investments Africa or Invest Africa. Uh, we do uh, not for me to speak too much. I will welcome Sharon just to introduce the initiative. And uh, after Sharon uh, introduced the initiative, we'll have Michelle, who's gonna talk about the exhibition the, uh, and uh, the attendee. Uh, Sharon, are you with us? The floor is yours. Yes, I, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, thank you so much, Chairman of ACB, for um, this wonderful opening speech and actually addressing the concerns that some of our um, colleagues in the industry would have had as regards to the recent events happening in South Africa. Thank you, Chairman, for addressing that. We um, appreciate that. Hello, everyone. It's a beautiful afternoon, a very busy one from Lagos, Nigeria. My name is Vera Sharon Okema. I am the lead initiator of the Tourism Invest Africa project, and I'm also the founder of um, GateHub, a, a, a travel and hospitality consulting company. With me here, I have my colleagues, my amazing colleagues from um, six of them from within Africa and the diaspora. And we, um, myself and Michelle, are just going to run you through the TIA initiative, um, where we are at the moment and what we are looking to achieve um, with the project. Um, TIA, which stands for Tourism of West Africa, is a project based. Our focus uh, is really to fill the gap that we see has been holding on to the sector prior to COVID-19 in terms of investment opportunities. So we feel that some of the challenges that we may have had in the industry as regards to um, lack of market information, infrastructure, with, with uh, cross-border tourism activities, um, lack of data, we know that these are some of the challenges that we have had as a sector for years um, within the continent. And we felt that it is time at post COVID-19 to fill that gap by um, engaging the sector, taking advantages of investment opportunities as they come up and um, where investment ready businesses will exhibit um, their businesses at this event. So Tourism Invest Africa is a project fund. Uh, it's partly supported by African Tourism Board. And currently one of the um, projects that we're running in terms of showcasing investment ready businesses is at the IATF, which stands for Inter-African Trade Fair. We have one of the representatives here who would join us and give us a run through of what the, um, the IAT stands for. So I'm not, not going to go into there. So for Tourism Invest Africa, what we have done currently and what we're doing now is that we're looking out and we're, we're going out for the, the, the lead uh, businesses who are one, either well structured and are investment ready and also those who are not pretty much structured but they're looking to how to get that structure and but they are investment ready. So we fund partnership with um, strategic partners within the continent and in the diaspora who will sort of like coach and support these businesses, those who are investment ready and well-structured and those who are investment ready and they need to do a lot of structuring. So we formed this partnership where we engage them towards um, exhibiting at the IATF uh, that is coming up now in South Africa, in Durban, South Africa in, in November. Our value proposition and the packages um, I would let my colleague Michelle to do that talking. So today is not really much um, all about us, but we're going to let our speakers have the floor and, and you know, talk much about those opportunities that we feel that our, our players, all of us travel to businesses, destinations have not been taken advantage of in terms of investment opportunities. And we feel that this is a time, mostly with the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement area, which we feel that the tourism sector 
should not be left behind um, as other sectors take advantage of this opportunity. So I'm going to let my colleague just do a quick run through of, the object, of, the, of our objective, our value proposition, and the packages. Then before we proceed to um, bring in um, one of the representatives from the IETF, and then our speakers will take the floor. So thank you, everyone. I do hope you enjoy and find this section very engaging to motivate you to get involved in this initiative. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vera. So um, Vera mentioned about the packages and the proposition that we would like to just tell you a little bit, a little bit about. Of course, the conversation starts here um, and we can continue to talk after this webinar and we can find out more about what you're looking for. Uh, greetings from London. I'm, part, I'm the diaspora and part of the team. My name's Michelle Fannison Hill and uh, I am the founder of the conference director. I have my own conference consultancy and I'm part of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful project with my team. And what, we, what our aims and our intentions are um, with Tourism Invest Africa is to create exhibition space or ho uh, host exhibition space at, at IATF in Durban in uh, November. And we'll use this space to showcase investment ready tourism and hospitality businesses in a way where you can display information, um, you can be present physically for networking and meeting uh, potential investors and partners. So it's a network and networking and information hub where you can showcase yourselves as a business. We're also, as Vera mentioned, will help businesses that are not quite ready for, uh, are not structured in the way that they need to be ready for investment through coaching and mentoring through our, our partners. And that will help those businesses to get investor ready. Um, packages begin from about seven or $800, depending on what you want to do. But as I said, it's all about bespoke and having conversations. The space is there to be utilized in the best way possible for the businesses that want to work with us. So that's what we're offering. Uh, as I said, it's an opportunity for showcasing, networking, and um, and networking with with potential investors and showcasing yourselves as a business uh, ready for investment. I think I'll leave it there because I can't wait to get on to what the other speakers have got to say. But do engage with us. Do drop us an email, and we're we're more than happy to schedule one-to-one -one meetings to continue the conversations with you all if you're interested. That's all from me. Thank you. You are on mute, Joseph. Ah, sorry, guys. <laughs> technology, technology. But we, we are getting through to that. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for speaking up on our introduction, value propositions. And, and all those kind of things. But like we said, this was initiated, initiated by Sharon's. Last year, she started talking to all of us, trying to find out how can we add value to the tourism industry from the different uh, countries that we are both coming from. We have Michelle who is it, uh, representing the diaspora currently in England. We have Sharon who is in, in Nigeria. We have Yvonne who is in South Africa. We have Emmanuel who is in Ghana. And then we have Iwoti, who is currently in Ethiopia, and me currently residing in Namibia. So as a team, we came as a collective team in order for us to make sure that uh, things work for both of us. So I will, and together with the support from the African Tourism Board, especially the chairperson, we make sure that we are ready. And we make sure that through this uh, conversation that we're engaging the industry, one of the key important uh, industry that we, we didn't want to leave behind, that was the hospitality uh, industry, because they are the power, they are the muscles, they are the one who earned value to the tourism industry. Without accommodation or without anything, tourists will not be able to work. With, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Janice Costa, who is a representative. She's actually in the marketing for uh, ITF. So she is here to urge to, to speak to us about the venue, 
because remember the venue was actually in Kigali and lately they just changed the venue to Durban, South Africa, of which I will conquer with the same words that the chairperson said, Durban should actually be a venue of which should be proposed. But at the same time, when we look at the business venue, Kigali was the optional one. So let me allow Janice to come uh, forward and uh, to speak to us about ITF. What is exactly intra-Africa trade fair? What value does that contribute to our tourism industry? Uh, Janice Costa, are you with us? Thank you, Joseph. I'm actually standing in for Janice this afternoon. Ah. Good afternoon and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I just want to share my screen if you'll be able to let me do that. Uh, you can be able to share your screen. I just made you a co-host, so you, uh, there we go. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share Inter-African Trade Fair with you. Mm -hmm. My name is Ivash. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing in for my colleague, Janice Costa. Inter-African Trade Fair is a multi-sectorial trade fair that focuses on inter-African trade. Inter-African trade is a critical factor for unlocking Africa's economic potential. This will take place this year in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal from the 15th to the 21st of November. Committed to transforming Africa, a Brixton bank launched the bilineal Inter-African Trade Fair in 2018 as a unique platform to connect African buyers, sellers, and investors. IATF is a bank initiative that is done in collaboration with the African Union and the AFCFTA Secretariat and the government of, uh, government of the Republic of South Africa and the province of KwaZulu-Natal. The IATF initiative supports the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA, marking an important step to su sustainably addressing the gap in trade and market information for the successful realization of the F AFCFTA. IATF will hold under the theme, Building Bridges for a Successful AFCFTA. The Inter-African Trade Fair 2021 will provide a unique and valuable platform for businesses to access an integrated African market of over 1.2 billion people and a combined GDP of just over 2.5 trillion US dollars created under the African Free Trade Area. IATF 2021 will focus on bringing together continental and global players who are seeking business and investment opportunities in Africa, serve as a marketplace where buyers and sellers meet and continue to explore various business opportunities, provide a platform for B2B and B2G networking and development of business opportunities, share trade, investment and market information to identify solutions whilst addressing challenges affecting inter-African trade to share information about the Frickson Bank Initiative's trade finance and trade facilitation intervention. The first edition of IATF 2018 attracted over 2,500 conference delegates, 1,000 exhibitors from over 45 countries, resulting in 32 billion US dollars worth of trade and investment deals that were closed at the event. The second edition of the Inter-African Trade, Trade Fair is expected to be bigger and aims to attract 5,000 conference delegates, 1,100 exhibitors, including 10,000 visitors and buyers from over 55 countries who will engage to grow trade and investment on the African continent and more than 40 billion US dollars in trade and investment deals are being targeted at IATF 2021. 
The key components of the second edition include a trade exhibition, the Trade and Investment Forum, IATF Virtual, Country Days, Creative Africa Nexus Program, B2B, B2G Exchanges, IATF Youth Startup Program, and the IATF Automotive Show. The exhibition, government agencies and large corporates can set up pavilions, enabling them to customize the exhibition to fit the unique requirements and the opportunity to showcase their goods and services. The exhibition will be a hybrid event that will consist of a B2B, B2G and a B2C component. Core element of the exhibition involves the hosted buyers program, African buyers from key sectors will be hosted to ensure that pre-scheduled meetings are arranged with exhibitors resulting in business deals. A minimum of 310 buyers, mainly from the African continent, will be matched with participating exhibitors. An online business matchmaking program will be set up, matching buyers and exhibitors. Three networking sessions will be held where exhibitors and buyers will have the opportunity to exchange business cards in a limited time managed format. The Trade and Investment Forum will be a four-day conference which will feature leading African and international speakers with and a variety of sessions dealing with African trade and investment. The IATF conference agenda will focus on the theme, Building Bridges for a Successful AFCFTA, recognizing the growth opportunities for inter-African cross-border trade and investment, bringing business owners and investors together to learn share and find solutions, as well as conclude trade and investment deals. Country days have, countries have been invited to bid for the country day feature. There are only six country days available and selected countries will have the opportunity to showcase their trade and investment, tourism and cultural opportunities. We currently only have two spots um, the slots currently being taken by South Africa, Rwanda, Nigeria, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. Trade at IATF 2021 promises to be the highlight of Africa's creative and cultural calendar. Hundreds of creators gathering in Durban, South Africa to exhibit, showcase, mm -hmm. and network with government leaders, prominent investors and financiers, thought leaders, and other creative mm -hmm. sector practitioners. More than simply a conference, over the course of IATF 2021, Canex at IATF 2021 will be a unique showcase and a celebra celebration of Africa's vibrant creative heart. Creative Africa Nexus will bring together the best and the brightest of Africa's creative sector through a substantial exhibition space, B2B and B2G meetings, and a comprehensive program of engaging conversations, panel discussions, live performances, installations, and screenings from the beginning of the end, beginning of the event till the end. IATF Automotive Show will present a platform for car manufacturers, assemblers, original equipment manufacturers, and component suppliers to exhibit their products and also interact with potential buyers and suppliers. The show has three components a dedicated exhibition, an automotive workshop, and a B2B and B2G platform. The Youth Startup Program at IATF 2021 will provide a platform for youth startups and SMEs throughout Africa to gain support through capacity development and mentoring, networking, access to finance, supportive infrastructure, enabling policies and market linkages, the youth startup segment will have a dedicated pavilion for youth startups in Africa, where they will showcase their goods and services. IATF 2021 will provide opportunities for matchmaking with venture capitalists and investors, entrepreneurship training, networking amongst the youth and other delegates of IATF 2021. IATF Virtual is a year-round platform to connect buyers and sellers from Africa and beyond. IATF Virtual brings together exhibitors and visitors from all sectors. It provides a platform for attendees and non-attendees alike to connect in a real time before, during, and after the event. The 
the IETF virtual platform offers a 24-7, 365 platform where the virtual visitors can visit virtual stands to engage and do business via the online platform. IETF Virtual also offers an auditorium to host virtual events, live and pre-recorded, as well as features country providers and a virtual library where documents, presentations, and other information can be sourced and stored. The merchandising and marketplace opportunity to purchase official IETF merchandise, as well as an opportunity for exhibitors to use the platform through the IETF mar marketplace to sell their products. We have a host of communication channels through which IETF is promoted. How you can participate, sign, sign up for an IETF virtual booth and benefit from the 365 24 seven platform, sign up for an exhibition booth in Durban and benefit from connecting buyers and sellers or register as a delegate for free and you can do this through an IETF website as registration is now open. Or sponsor and join our partners who are benefiting the rewards of being associated to IETF. We offer customized of uh, sponsorship opportunities for businesses big and small. As a partner, you will benefit access of to over a thousand buyers, 1,100 exhibitors and 10,000 visitors. IETF is the only platform where you have access to meet 55 African governments, qualified global hosted buyers and investors. Why not get your brand associated with a captive audience who could be your next business opportunity? Don't miss this opportunity to be part of the conversation as we develop into African trade. We urge you to participate and grab your opportunity before someone else does. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact us directly. Our website is regularly being updated with current information. Stay in touch through our social media platforms for the most up-to-date information. We look forward to seeing you in Durban in November 21, 2021. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Naidu, for such a brilliant presentation. Uh, who can be able to redefine that and say we're not going to Durban in November? So personally, I will say me and my team, we are ready to go. So that's why we talk about uh, tourism readiness investments and holding a webinar like this one. So I think from what you just presented, I believe everybody is convinced on this platform and uh, we should be able to see each and everyone in Durban by, uh, by November. So I thank you very much for coming through. And uh, this was a lovely, lovely presentation. And um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, as we continue, uh, should anybody have any questions or would like to ask anything, please feel free. You have all our contact details and you can see that the contact detail was being shared. So we can be able to get uh, this rolling up because if we keep on waiting, we'll wait for another uh, 15 years in order for us to find uh, what is what is the way forward? And uh, once again, Ms. Naidu, thank you very much. You all feel free to stay with us. And then, should anybody in the audience have a question, we have a session at the end where it's an NQA or it's a question and answer uh, uh, moment where if you have any question, uh, you can be able to ask. Uh, let me bring up the next uh, speaker on our program. Uh, she's an uh, American-based award-winning hospitality professional with a proven uh, history of Tennessee, strong driving, patience, uh, leadership over uh, 10 years. Uh, she's the founder and uh, the past president and the chairperson of the trustee of women uh, in hospitality in Nigeria. And uh, she recently, she's the co-founder of African Association of Women in Tourism and Hospitality. Allow me to welcome uh, Ms. Amaka uh, to the stage so that she can be able to uh, speak to us about the investment opportunity uh, within the diaspora. How ready are the diasporans to come back and reinvest in Africa? 
she is Nigerian, so let's not look at her as uh, as American, as they say. And uh, because she lived in the diaspora, we say she is not African. She is still our sister, and we love her, and we look forward to her investment in Africa. Amaka, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you, um, Tourism Invest Africa, for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the diasporans. Um, I've been in the hospitality industry for a while and I'm very passionate about it. And hence why I'm encouraged to also impact on, on the African hospitality space. So without taking much of your time, let me just share my screen and start my presentation. Okay, so to speak about the importance of driving investors in the diaspora to hospitality trade, um, I'll give some market information and accessibility. So um, according to the Jumia Hospitality Report 2019, um, Africa's travel and tourism industry remains one of the continent's key growth drivers, accounting for 8.5% of GDP in 2018, up from 8.1% and 7.8% in 2017 and 2016, respectively. Um, with, a growth of, with a growth rate of 5.6% in 2018, Africa was the second fastest growing tourism region in the world, trailing only Asia, Pacific, and compared to a global average growth rate of 3.9%. That's an encouraging number, which shows that if we keep um, driving and if we keep trying to come up with initiatives and ways and using tools to drive African tourism, we'll probably get to the top. Um, Morocco and South Africa were the most popular tourist destinations with approximately 11 and 10 million visitors per year, respectively. Ethiopia's visa relaxation policies combined with improved connectivity as a regional transport hub propelled the country to the top of Africa's fastest growing travel countries. In 2018, the travel and tourism sector directly and indirectly employed approximately 24.3 million people. In terms of room revenue, Nigeria is expected to be the fastest growing market in the next five years with a compound annual growth rate, growth rate of 12%, followed by Tanzania and Kenya. So just to give you a highlight of some of the countries who have um, been driving their tourism and are ranking high. We have the likes of Mauritius, we have the likes of South Africa, we have the likes of Seychelles, Morocco, Namibia, Kenya, Tunisia, Cape Verde, Botswana, and Tanzania. This is not to say that other African countries are not trying to push their tourism, but these are the countries that have um, led the, um, should I say, the crusade of pushing African tourism forward. Now, talking about the hospitality industry, the hospitality industry is one of the fastest growing industries in tourism. Um, and it's, it's a growth driver for every, any economy and it helps with economic growth for any host country. So it's an industry that is specialized, but yet um, drives opportunities in different um, industries. So if, a country decides to invest in the hospitality industry or encourage investment in the hospitality industry, there's a value chain that will benefit from this. Other industries will also benefit from the growth in the hospitality industry. Um, industries like agriculture, when it comes to food, um, in the hospitality industry, it involves food industry, it involves the hotels. So agriculture will definitely benefit from the growth in the industry. When we talk about garments, we talk about fashion, because when you drive tourists to your destination, you see them interested in a lot of things about that country, culture, garments, entertainment, all that will be part of it. Human capital, of course, employment growth will be encouraged. Um, we'll have more specialized um, employees in the service industry, manufacturing, engineering, education, gaming, now, when it comes to gaming, this is very interesting because there's a company currently called Best Man Games who is 
driving tourism and education at the same time through their games. Um, I'll just give a few minutes. I have a, a colleague here who is going to talk about it. She's the CEO of Best Man Gaming, just to highlight on how tourism and gaming and education can drive and um, push tourism to different countries because now it's getting the attention of the diaspora and we're here. I don't know if Amaka is on the call. Yes, I am. Okay, so just give us like a, a quick brief on what you're doing with Best Man Games in terms of education and driving tourism. Okay, thank you so much, Amaka Matoko. Um, my name is Amaka Amalu. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Best Man Games Limited, and I'm very happy to be here. Hospitality and tourism has always been of interest to me, and um, I'm excited to be amongst professionals. So Bestman Games Limited is a leading games company in, based in Nigeria, and uh, we work very directly with Hasbro. I'm sure we all know the Monopoly board game and Hasbro, which is the global games um, leader in the world. So um, we have the franchise uh, from Hasbro to produce customized Monopoly board games for the whole of Africa, excluding two countries. So we have the franchise to produce the uh, customized Monopoly board games for 48 countries in Africa. At the moment, we have existing uh, editions. We have the City of Lagos edition. We have the Accra edition. We have the Nigerian Centenary edition. We have the Cross River State edition. We have the Corona Schools edition. And at the moment, we're working on several other, both local and international editions. I know at the moment we're working with Kenya, we're working with Rwanda, we're working at Benin Republic and um, Ivory Coast at the moment. So what do we use the Monopoly board game to do? Um, Amaka has mentioned two key areas, education and tourism. So on the education part, uh, for those of us who understand the game of the Monopoly, we know it's a major real estate and properties game. So we use it to drive financial literacy education. We use it to drive mathematics. We use it to drive real estate and property knowledge. And we use it to also drive ethics, you know, which is very major, especially in the society that we live in now. On the tourism part, um, which is more relative to what we're doing here today, we use the Monopoly as a major tool to showcase major tourist attractions, to showcase iconic landmarks, major cultural and heritage sites, and build compelling stories and narratives around these to the extent that people want to know and also want to be part of it. We understand that the US, where Amaka is at the moment, and Europe generally has always been interesting um, getaway places, so vacation places and holiday places. But for now, we know also that we have very beautiful locations here in Africa. I mean, I've traveled um, a bit and uh, I've been around the world a bit. I have decided also that, okay, so I decided three years ago that I want to start doing more of local tourism. So when I say local tourism, I mean tourism in Nigeria and tourism in Africa, because there are so many beautiful places that, that are that are you know, all over Africa, and we haven't even been to those places. So that is what we use the game of the Monopoly to do. So a lot of people really want to come to Africa, but they do not have the story. They do not have the motivation to come. So what we do is we have placed these very lovely places, very lovely locations. We have placed um, thriving businesses. You know, we have placed reputable brands that have done a lot in the business space in a game called the Monopoly. And the Monopoly game, as we know, is a is a world is a world famous game. So it's played all over the world, and that is what we are, you know, in, 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 intending to use the Monopoly board game for. So hospitality comes to play in all of these. You know, we know shelter in in tourism is a major motivation for for travels, you know, and getaways and vacations and all. So I'll make an example. I was at the Obudukato Ranch. I'm sure some, some of us here know the Obudukato Ranch. I was there for Easter. And for those who know, the, 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 the scenery is breathtakingly stunning. But I was not very pleased with the accommodation. I mean, nothing stops major hotel brands from coming, as, um, from, from coming to you know, run Obudukato Ranch and run some of the very major tourist places that we have in Africa. Investment is major. You know, we, we, we might not have the funds to do this. We might not have the creativity, you know, to the extent that is world standard or something to do this. But we have major hotel brands. We have major hospitality brands that will be 
you know, able to take on these assignments, these, these tasks, you know, and make these locations something that um, everyone in the world will want to come. So again, there is a major expedition that is coming up soon in somewhere in Nigeria. It's Akwai Bomb State. For those who know Akwai Bomb, you know, it's a major tourist location. You know? And as soon as we have established a trail, okay, as soon as we have, we have embarked on the expedition and established a trail, you know, we need a major hospitality intervention, you know, to, for, 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 thing, for people to be able to say, you know what, this expedition, this trail, we want to go and see, you know, what is happening there, we want to be a part of it. So that is really what we're doing with the Monopoly board game. Um, like, I, like, like I said, a lot of work is also going on around Africa. So aside the local editions that we're coming up with, we are working with other African countries to throw in iconic landmarks and major tourist attractions into the Monopoly board game so people can see and investors can be very, you know, um, uh, motivated to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Amaka, for having me share this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm allowing her to talk about the game is over here in the diaspora, there's so much excitement and so much um, interest in coming down to Africa because through the games, they're seeing certain um, tourist sites, they're um, getting to understand the story about Africa and it's really encouraging a lot of young ones to show that interest in coming back to Africa. So imagine where the diaspora have that interest to come home and invest, it will be a big, a big one for Africa. So also another industry that will be um, benefiting from the growth of, of the hospitality industry is transportation and real estate. Now, talking about the diaspora and investments, at least we need to understand what diaspora means. According to the African Union, diaspora um, is defined as the, the African diaspora consists of people of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. Um, a lot of us are aware that a lot of African Americans are really trying hard to find their roots back in Africa. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of attention right now on Africa. A lot of Black Americans want to come home, find out their roots, get to know about the history, get to know, see um, tourist sites, get to be educated about Africa because a lot of them are not really educated. So I would also categorize them as people in the diaspora, even if they have a citizenship with the United States, but they have roots down in Africa. Now, types of diaspora investments, we have the diaspora remitt remittances. Um, numerous studies at the macro and micro levels have been conducted on diaspora remittances. And there's strong evidence that remittances are a major engine for development in Africa. According to the World Bank, formal remittances to Africa totaled $6 billion in 2019. Egypt, Nigeria, and Morocco received 70% of this total. That's huge. Now, remittances are being made to family, friends, not fully investment. So imagine where we, as a continent, we create those opportunities for people in the diaspora to actually send down money or remit money and invest in different sectors. Now, particularly in the hospitality sector, sector, imagine how much money will be pushed down to the African economy. In the case of Nigeria, the amount remitted in 2018 was $22 billion, which is greater than our federal budget. That's huge. Um, Former remittances alone account for more than 10% of the GDP in five countries, in Comoros, in uh, the Gambia, Lesotho, Cape Verde, and Liberia. So imagine where every country in Africa is getting a, a, at least a bit of um, the amount of money coming down to Africa and it's invested in businesses. Imagine the growth, imagine the opportunities, and it's something we should look into. Um, other types of diaspora investments are diaspora direct investment, which is real estate loans, intra transactions with business organizations. Um, we also have diaspora philanthropy. There are a lot of people who 
want to give back to Africa and um, go through the NGOs. There are a lot of diasporans here looking for legit opportunities to give back to Africa. So it's something that we can explore. And I think the hospitality industry being an, um, an industry that is really growing can take advantage of such investments. Um, we also have the diaspora portfolio investment, which has to do with equity securities, direct investment or reserve assets. Now, highlighting importance of the diaspora investment, what it can do, it promotes growth by bringing superior technology or business practices that are then adopted by domestic firms. Now, one thing I know in Africa is, in terms of our hospitality industry, we have a lot of work to do in terms of service. We have a lot of work to do in terms of using technology to improve our service standards. Um, we have a lot of work to do in terms of um, maintaining those service standards. So we need to also take advantage of the technology in the Western world to improve our own um, standards and services. So it will be a good thing if we encourage the diasporans who are, who are already in technology here and advancing the Western world to come back home and also invest in our own um, industry. Also, um, it expands the capital stocks and brings liquidity to developing countries, many of which have ineffective capital markets and major liquidity issues. Um, the F FDI affects growth by increasing total productivity and more broadly the efficiency with which resources are used in recipient economies. So it's an important tool that can be used. It's an important sector that can be used. That investment is needed back home in, in Africa. We can't just leave our diaspora brothers to keep investing in the Western world. The Western world is progressing. Meanwhile, Africa is going backward. So for the hospitality industry, now, right now, a lot of brands are showing interest. International brands are showing so much interest in developing their hospitality brands in Africa. What about the local brands? What about the local owners? What are we doing with our um, African brands in terms of hospitality? How are we trying to push to also compete with the international brands? Of course, we need investments. A lot of African brands have issues with investment, getting investment, putting money in the hospitality industry. But that's a very lucrative industry in terms of um, cost of operations is pretty low. Um, it's a profit-oriented industry. So a lot of our African brands need to take advantage of those Africans that are in the diaspora that are willing to invest and bring them back to Africa. Now, this is a roadmap to attracting diaspora and investment engagements, because I'm sure some people are wondering, okay, so how do I go about it? How do I get the diasporans interested in coming to invest in my hospitality business? First of all, you have to identify your goals and capacity. Match goals to diaspora resources, human and financial. Um, you should also, sorry, strengthen an, in, an inventory of existing diaspora institutions and programs, both on the national level, regional level, and local level. Um, another th way is you need to know your diaspora. Who are those in your diaspora? What is it about? What, are, who, what kind of people does it constitute of? Um, identify the opinion of interlocal with diaspora, listening exercises, and analysis of census data, mapping of diaspora organizations, skills inventory. So you need to do some form of research to know your diaspora. Um, you also have to build trust because that's one major important factor or component of being able to get them involved in your business. You have to build trust. And how can you do this? You can have cultural events, language promotions, explanation of and feedback on government diaspora policies. Um, give them dual citizenship because a lot of them sometimes don't feel like they're being welcomed home. So with that dual citizenship, you're showing that um, allegiance that you're welcoming them back to Africa, especially those that were not born in Africa but have African roots. Um, services to the diaspora, documents, classes, social services, privileges to non-resident expatriates and descendants, um, interventions with host governments. So we need to build trust for them to confidently come back and invest. A lot of them are looking for opportunities to come home to invest. Um, another way is mobilize stakeholders, mobilize your government, mobilize the diaspora, mobilize the civil societies, get them involved. 
um, have high profile events, diaspora spokespersons should be involved in whatever you're doing. Now, we're not just talking about um, just a business, we're talking about a country as a whole. How do you attract your um, brother, brothers and sisters in the diaspora to come in and invest in your business? So these are um, ways that we can use to engage and invest and get diaspora investments into our country and into the hospitality industry. So now, if you look at it, if you consider how much growth and development will occur in the industry, if the host countries utilize foreign investment and diaspora investment, limitless opportunities for both citizens and continents. So I think it's something that a lot of hospitality organizations, both the local brands and the upcoming brands and the hospitality service industry, the food industry, transportation, real estate, should look into ways to encourage diasporans and build that trust. The trust is the most important part. Because of um, a lot of backward stories about Africa, a lot of people are really scared to come back home and trust the process or trust the government that and know that their investments are secured. So that's one thing we need to build. We need to build that trust to encourage us diasporans to come home and invest. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you once again, Amaka, for such a lovely uh, presentations. And uh, this is uh, what we are talking about, uh, investment uh, readiness in Africa. And uh, just to contribute to that, we have to understand that AMACA has contributed to the reform, reshaping growth of the social economic development of the hospitality and tourism industry in Nigeria. And she has been awarded a couple of uh, awards and uh, she has also worked from the Global Leadership Institute and she established the first hospitality and tourism award in Nigeria called Pain Award. So she's one of the very, very uh, most um, contributor towards the investment readiness and uh, especially coming from the diaspora and understanding the investment of uh, the diasporans. So with that, Amaka, once again, thank you very, very much for taking your time to be with us today. And uh, this is really, really nice to hear from someone that we can actually take back in to what it has been established. Trust is always an issue because some of us, we do it in an honest way, but thank you for bringing that up. And I have attended a couple of um, webinar where the diasporans are emphasizing of coming back, but they always feel like they are not treated well, they are not welcome at home, and we do not show them that much of trust. And I'm really happy that you have touched uh, on that. Uh, with further due, let me bring uh, someone uh, on the stage again. She is the CEO, uh, current CEO of uh, Hospitality Association of Namibia with a very uh, good back background of an association uh, with the aim and objective as a true umbrella body for hospitality sectors and the main and foremost objective of, of, of HAN or Hospitality Association of Namibia is to promote the common interest of its member. Uh, Mrs. Gita Pitzhoe, she is with us today and she is going to talk about um, investment readiness, especially when it's come to post-COVID. The significance of investment in hospitality industry post-COVID. Uh, Mrs. Gita Pitzhoe, allow me to take this opportunity also to apologize to you because when we spoke the other day, I said there's no need for a presentation. And I believe that you being uh, one of the legends in hospitality industry in Southern Africa. So I will have to apologize for that, for telling you that no need for a presentation, but you can speak from your heart. But I do trust and I do believe that you can speak from your heart about the significant of investment in hospitality and tourism industry. Mrs. Pitzo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joseph. And wow, I've learned quite a lot in the last half an hour that I've been listening to 
our African brothers and sisters. And it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see the kind of commitment that is out there. Um, we all know what, what COVID did to tourism and specifically uh, the hospitality sector is currently bleeding because um, here in Namibia, and I can just give you a bit of background, Han is the association for the tourism accommodation sector. We've got about 300 of our members being the hotels, the lodges, guest farms, the rest camps, tented lodges, everything covering basically accommodation and there's a wide diversity of, of various accommodation offerings here in Namibia. Um, we've been running on occupancies that are, yeah, um, none to speak of almost because of the travel bans that the international community has put on us. Um, but there's always scope and there's always hope for, for improvement and it's so appealing and, and Joseph, um, I know that this webinar has been postponed and I think the timing that, that we've chosen today is excellent because Namibia can today proudly say that despite all the odds, um, we can just announce that one of our biggest um, accommodation establishments, the single house accommodation establishments, also the founding establishment of Han some 34 years ago, the Safari Hotel, um, has just been taken over by an African investment group, um, Cascada Investments. They've got a company based in Mauritius and they have been able to announce, I mean, it's been a, a deal that has been running for four years now. Um, investments were sought first locally and regionally, but obviously um, a, a, an establishment of, of some thousand beds, 500 rooms, um, there's no single sort of investor that um, was ready to actually take on that big opportunity here in Namibia. So after a lot of um, negotiations and, and, and you know, deals being, being discussed, um, this company is a French company, Cascada, based in Mauritius. So it's basically coming home to Africa. It's so pleasing to see that they are willing buyers and investors that, that invest in, in tourism. They've taken over or will be taking over um, the Safari Hotel, our biggest single hotel here in Namibia. Um, and they've promised, and you know, it was so, yeah, heartwarming and encouraging given the time that we are in, where they said nothing can ever replace tourism and the experience that people have traveling to other parts of the world. Um, and like some of our colleagues said, you know, tourism or especially hospitality is so much more than just brick and mortar. It's it's the kind of feeling that you get, the the designs that you see, the garments and, and the taste, the food. Um, but hospitality is so much more than just a room um, and to be able to invest in that. And I said that cannot be replaced by what we're doing today. And that is virtually negotiating and talking to one another. Uh, um, hospitality or tourism is so much more than than just, you know, a flight to a different country, it's the experience that we have. And that's what makes um, investing in something like hospitality so much more rewarding and, and valuable. Um, currently, I know here in Namibia, um, as I say, there's the, the, the amount that has been sort of spent in, in taking over the, the, the 500 room hotel here in Namibia has not been disclosed. I do know that we were talking about um, 350, 380 million Namibia dollars um, at an exchange rate of about one to 14 to the US dollar. Um, so quite a sizable sum of money has been invested coming from not the international community, but an African investor, which makes it all the more valuable. Um, there are more of, of such offerings currently being uh, made available here in Namibia because obviously with um, us having basically had occupancies of 20, 24% in the last 12 to 18 months, um, much of, of the spending capital, uh, operational capital has been depleted. Um, and Namibia is a very small economy. We've only got two and a half million people. Our tourism infrastructure is, however, very rich. Um, we've got beautiful establishments here from the hotels in the cities to um, very remote and exquisite lodges all over um, Namibia. Um, there's another, um, news that has just come out two, four weeks ago of a, a five-star lodge close to our um, Etosha National Park, which is a, it's an icon of Namibia. It's one of the flagship products that we do have, um, National Park with, with wildlife and gaming. Um, that private sector lodge has just also been taken up by a Namibian investor, however, or an investment group. So the opportunities are, are wide and, and um, diverse. What um, I really like in terms of a call from the diaspora to say, please, you know, we need trust in, in knowing that if we come back to Africa and we do invest our, our earnings that we've made across the globe, uh, we need to know that it's it's being dealt with and, and processed um, properly and, and professionally. 
Namibia has just last year launched its Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board because we do see that there is need for trust in investing in Africa. And our Investment um, Promotion and Development Board is doing exactly that, is coordinating all the efforts that are here, both locally for search of investment and those investors out there, be it from the African continent or across the globe, to actually come to, to a place like Namibia or the rest of Africa to make sure that the investments that are being negotiated are being done so in a, in a professional and coordinated way. So there is reach out already. Namibia basically has put all um, the modus operandi is in place to actually talk about investments and talk about um, you know, conducive negotiations between the property owner or the current developer or business owner and, and investors, be they local, regional or international, um, to make sure that, that um, what is being invested in this country is actually being done so in the interest of the people here in Namibia, but also the investor as such. There have been some concerns, and I know there's also been debate in terms of the Africa Free Trade Agreement, um, whether one should actually cap some of the opportunities that there are for, um, you know, the local potential, the local Namibians. And I was asked by one of the radio journalists this morning when the news um, hit the public in terms of um, Safari Hotel being taken over by an international investor, um, whether we as Namibians are not concerned about that because obviously we would want to have our products kept for Namibians. And I could only say that tourism is such an international business. Um, we do actually need that kind of relationship. Um, and to us, it, it, it's, it was a way of encouragement to see that a huge international company is willing to invest in Namibia. And, and the compliment that we got given by the investors, French company um, based in Africa, when, when they said, you know, the choice for Namibia was because Namibia seems such an easy place to invest in. Um, you know, we've got direct routings to, to um, the international market. We've got a very well-developed infrastructure here in Namibia um, concerning our roads and our telecommunication. And we've got only two and a half million people to serve. So Namibia is a, it's an exquisite country and Joseph would be able to join me in praising our own country. But it's such an easy place to invest in. Yes, it's very dry and you know, very sparse populated. Um, some people do feel lost, especially if they come from places like Nigeria or even the Americas. They sometimes feel lost because you would travel on roads and don't see an, a car for, for an hour. Um, but that's what makes our country special. And especially now post COVID, I think that's what many people would want to escape to is, you know, that free open space, that basically isolation. We've got social distancing coming naturally to, to um, people that, that visit Namibia. So um, I think we have all- <laughs> We have all structures in place that right. actually invite and, and be accessible right. to yeah. investors. Um, and, and I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding and... Sorry, Lamanta. Uh, okay. I think... I see there was an issue. Um, the host has with me for a while. Joseph, am I back on? Yes, I think... Yes, you are back on Gita. Sorry, there was uh, somebody who was speaking on the background. My no problem. So uh, just a summary, um, Namibia is ready for investments. We've had one of the big trial ones already with our biggest single accommodation establishment, the Safari Hotel has just announced that they have um, found investments from um, Cascada Investment based in Mauritius. Um, there's been a private sector lodge also being taken over by local investors. So. We, we can cater for both. And I think the idea of having the um, Inter-Africa Trade Forum um, hosted in, in Durban in November, I think is an exciting news. Some of us here in tourism are very well aware of the Durban and Dava that we used to have every year talking about tourism and marketing. And I think um, it's so befitting to see that the Tourism Investment Forum is taking place at that center. Um, and I think if we can get um, proposals or sort of a proper structured invitation and um, that could be shared to our wider industry, not only the HAN members, but through Joseph and, and the Federation of Namibian Tourism Organizations to the rest of the tourism industry here in Namibia to ensure that um, we as, as tourism players in, in Namibia present ourselves to the rest of the world in terms of opening up opportunities that they are because 
um, just as much as tourism um, is an important sector and an economic sector in the rest of, of um, Africa, um, tourism here plays a huge role. We, we employ about 11 to 15% of all Namibians in tourism, or I should now say we used to employ because COVID has actually put a red line through many of our stats and, and statistics. Um, but also under normal circumstances, Namibian tourism contributed some 11 to 15% to our GDP. Tourism is a very, very important sector of, of our economy. And what is nice about tourism, and that brings me back to the significance of investing in hospitality. Hospitality, um, as you would all know much better than I do, is basically the most committed sector because we have to put down brick and mortar. It's, it's an immovable investment that is being made and it's being made in the wide um, and remotest areas, not only in, in um, urban areas, but the charm and the attraction of, of tourism here in Namibia is in the remote areas where usually there is not much other opportunity for employment creation. So tourism really takes opportunities in terms of employment and um, skills development and opportunities li to create livelihoods to our people in the most remote areas. And that's that's the value to me um, in investing in hospitality because it's a very committed um, investment that one makes and it, it, it's an investment made for the people that, that live in, in the most remote areas. And that's the charm, but we need to make that connection. I think this platform is excellent to help make the connection to investors in the diaspora um, with the people on the ground here that are so desperate to get back their livelihoods in terms of offering that warm hospitality that we are used to, to offering to, to the world um, population. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Gita. And uh, my apologies still continue. And uh, from a journalist point of view, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you don't need a screen or a slide in order to speak about investment. Kita was once uh, a very prominent uh, journalist, worked for the Namibian uh, Broadcasting Corporations just before she became the CEO of uh, HAN. So thank you, Mrs. Gita, and uh, your contribution is always very much valuable. And I think from the team, we'll take it further and uh, engage together with HAN so that we can reach the industry in Namibia. But just to speak about the hospitality industry, we have to understand that Southern Africa uh, has some of a very, very strong uh, background when it's come to hospitality. And one is Han is one of them. It's one of the industry that has been fighting, has been uh, combating, has been trying to speak about the industry and uh, investment readiness in uh, Southern Africa. few notes, I would like to say thanks once again, uh, Miss Gita, for taking her time uh, to make sure that she's with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I would like to bring someone on a stage, and um, I'm just wondering if uh, that person is here, is uh, Mr. Nuno Forte. Mr. Nuno Forte is uh, from Mozambique uh, Tourism Authority, and uh, Mr. Nuno Forte has to speak about the government. Sorry, Joseph. Sorry, Joseph. Yes. I'm just reading a message from um, the ministry. He's unable to meet up um, with, with the timing because he has another meeting with, that is running into this timing. So he won't be able to uh, show up. So we have to skip his parts here, unfortunately. OK. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharon. And uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me just for a few minutes, uh, I would love to share uh, the video that was uh, shared uh, to us about the ITF Durban KwaZulu Natal before I could give, uh, I could give the opportunity to my uh, colleague, uh, Yvonne, that will take us to the call of action. Just uh, give me a few minutes. Let me share the video with you so that we can uh, be able to watch this uh, short video. And uh, from there, we will take it on and uh, we'll continue with our conversations.
thank you all. And um, allow me to welcome Yvonne, uh, just for, to speak to each and everyone about the call of action for Tourism Invest Africa. And uh, once she is done, ladies and gentlemen, we still have about five to 10 minutes of uh, question and answer. So we are be able to question you or speak to you about uh, anything, or you can be able to ask ask about how you can be part and parcel of uh, uh, TIA or tourism investment. Yvonne, the mic is yours. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Joseph. Just confirm that you can hear me. I'm not sure. Joseph, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thank you for all our speakers. I think each of the speakers had a very significant contribution um, to make towards painting the picture of what Tourism in West Africa is trying to, to achieve here. And it just makes my job so much easier when I come in right at the end to really just wrap up and explain what it is that we, we are trying to achieve and what the call to action is. So essentially, um, what we are wanting to do is have a maiden representation of the African tourism and hospitality industry at the IATF 2021 that's happening in Durban in November. And the call to action is quite simple um, for exhibitors, for sponsors, and for attendees. Very similar to what was what was um, given right in the beginning from the IATF, Ms. Naidu. From the TIA side, what we are offering is an opportunity for investor-ready businesses to join in together. Now, these investor-ready businesses will have to be African businesses, and they would have to be businesses within the tourism and hospitality space that are looking for investors to invest in their businesses. And if you come with us to the IATF 2021, the package that we're offering would include your accommodation, daily breakfast, a return airport transfer, of course, your exhibition space um, as part of the TIA delegation, your business coaching on alignment um, with regards to what you would need to do to make sure leading up to the conference to make sure um, that your business is ready for investors. Um, and then coaching and mentoring to make sure that you are able to capitalize on the opportunities and to make sure that you're able to secure an investor once you get there. And we are also able to ensure um, or to rather facilitate investor one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings during that week in, in Durban. So if you are an exhibitor, you are encouraged to get in touch with us on the email. Um, that will be shared at the end of this, this presentation. If you are an investor-ready business, then you would fall within that exhibitors category. If you are part of an association or a government entity or a business indeed that is looking to sponsor initiatives, or to sponsor this initiative or even to sponsor a business within your country, um, you want to get behind a certain tourism or hospitality business, then please get in touch at the same email address. And then thirdly, if you are neither of the above, we are always open for um, champions and partners. Now, champions would mean people that are able to connect us to other people that might be able to exhibit or sponsor, um, people that are willing to share our social media posts, um, share our newsletters within their net respective networks so that the relevant people are able to, um, to get the message and really come on board with this initiative. Um, partners are people that are able to work with us within the team, especially on the ground um, within your relevant country. At the moment, as Joseph 
mentioned in the beginning, we have got representation in Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, Namibia, and South Africa, and within the diaspora space in the UK. So if you are um, anywhere in the world at this point in time, and you believe that you can lend your expertise, we are also open to that. Thank you so much, Joseph. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you, uh, Yvonne, for such a lovely call of actions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, guests, uh, these are the moments that we have all been waiting for. Uh, should anybody have a question, please uh, do just raise your hands and uh, I'll make sure that I divert to you or I, I mute you so that you can be able to uh, ask that questions. And uh, for those who have been sending our uh, on the chat, we have received all your requests and please note that as soon as the webinar is over, we will try to respond to all your questions and we will share the presentation, we will share the documents, we will share the application forms and we will share this uh, webinar that we have just heard. We will send you the link so that you can be able to rewatch it and you can be able to revisit uh, our landing page for more information. Uh, we'll really uh, feel free. Uh, time for questions. Should anybody have uh, a question? I can see that there's no that much of questions. And uh, Mr. Pierre, uh, just uh, going to take uh, this uh, few minutes to say merci beaucoup d'avoir participé avec nous. On va répondre à tout uh, votre message. Uh, dès qu'on est fini et puis on va organiser uh, un jour un petit uh, briefing juste pour discuter avec vous uh, comment on peut faire uh, pour uh, investir en, uh, dans ce uh, uh, projet. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, let me once again um, call upon Michelle to give the words of thanks to everybody, the speakers, and uh, for those who participated on this uh, hospitality webinar. Michelle, if you're with us, your word of thanks it will be really much appreciated. Unmute it would help yourself. if I unmuted. Yeah, it would help if I unmuted. Thank you. What a very insightful, exciting webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. There were some fascinating presentations uh, from the two speakers and interesting to know about the investment impacts that Gita, uh, that Gita shared with us in, in Namibia. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for taking the time today to, for you to, for, for, um, to participate and taking the time out of your day. Um, as I said in my, when I spoke earlier, this is the beginning of the conversation. So we would love to schedule some meetings with you one-to-one -to, -one to talk through how best uh, you can showcase yourselves within our um, space at the IATF. As, as I also meant to say, uh, thank you for um, uh, from, from Agashni who, who spoke all about the IATF and giving us the figures and the scale and size of the event. You did, did us proud. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, so yes, I guess there's not much else to say. I mean, 10,000 visitors, 1,000 exhibitors and 51 countries. Uh, I, guess, I guess it's a no-brainer, isn't it? That's what we say in London. It's an absolute no-brainer to come on board. If you've got a tourism uh, business, definitely showcase yourselves with us. Um, and yeah, let's start the conversation. Um, and I look forward to uh, speaking with you all one-to-one. -one. Um, so thank you. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, once again, thank you everybody, Gita, Amaka, uh, Mrs. Naidu, for all the wonderful presentations. Uh, let me wish you all a lovely afternoon and uh, hope to speak to you soon again. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Joseph. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hello. Hello. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.
Hello, bye bye. Bye bye. Hello. I guess I'm going to stop my recording.